Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to another episode of Ferris Makes Demos. Um, today I thought I would just continue working on some stuff that I'm working on anyway. Um, I know that I've been talking a lot about compression lately, and most of that has been focused on our 64K compressor for PC. Um, one of the things that I started working on a little more recently was, in the context of our 64K packer, I wrote a compressor that compresses the decompressor of our main, or of the, the 64K compressor. Uh, and this saves, uh, I think we netted like 460 bytes or something off of every intro by doing that, which is really nice. Um, so that, that unpacker is still like four or 500 bytes larger than Crunchy's, but we're netting or we're gaining, you know, two or three K in the compressed data size. So it's, it's pretty good net wins. Anyway, um, in developing that compressor, uh, I, I developed a small LZ compressor with like an arithmetic coder backend. And I'm pretty much um, pretty much done with that in the context of the 64K packer because it's like uh, the, the decompressor there has to be extremely tiny. And so the, the feature set that it actually supports and the, the amount of, of things we put in the encoding has to be really small. And there's most ideas that I tried to kind of throw at that didn't actually do very much or didn't really justify themselves in terms of size. So, so that ended up being pretty minimal, but it, it actually got me thinking a lot, um, especially because I tried a lot of different kind of entropy coders with it. I tried uh, a few different permutations of arithmetic coders. I tried uh, an ANS variant and just to kind of play with different, like mostly to balance um, code complexity uh, with accuracy um and in in that context it's it's basically pretty cut and dry to be honest like the the difference between the ans coder and the arithmetic coder in terms of accuracy and like uh coding loss is is basically negligible uh negligible difference between the two um but i ended up going with an arithmetic coder because it ended up using less registers in the update loop which was kind of nice um maybe that's something i can revisit a bit later but anyway when I was thinking about that, it got me thinking about uh, one of my C64 compressors. So a couple years ago, I released um, a 4K called Makeshift uh, for the C64. I'm really proud of that prod. Um, and one of the things I did as part of developing that was I made a custom LZ compressor. And that was probably the first time I had done that since like 2011. Uh, and at that time, I just did really, really crappy crappy codex but but i kind of learned uh kind of the gist of how they worked and how you would do do a match search and how you might design such an encoding and i actually did uh an lz based like byte oriented lz packer for the c64 at that time and it had very bad compression but it was really fast um that's probably the only thing that was good about it um and it taught me a lot about lz codex uh, i don't even think it had it had a bitwise io at the time <clears throat> definitely didn't do any kind of proper entropy coding um but I don't know, kind of got me on the way. And then I didn't touch that again until doing the Packer for Makeshift where I went really deep into that and had a lot of fun with that. But anyway, um, when I did that Packer for Makeshift, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm really tired today. So I'm going to be as rambly as usual. Um, but yeah, when doing the Packer for Makeshift, uh, we, we did pretty well. Um, the current best packer like at that kind of uh so, so it was a, it was a 4k intro so we needed to um we need decent compression and a, and a pretty small decompressor and the best the best existing tool for that that's released to the public at least and that i know about is exomizer um it does really well on that kind of data uh, i didn't want to use exomizer because i wanted to develop my own and the one that i developed didn't beat exomizer i think the decompressor was like 20 bytes bigger and the and the compressed size was like 60 bytes bigger so in total we were like uh 80 to 100 bytes worse uh roughly than um than exomizer was but i still used it because i worked hard on it and i thought that was fun um and i also had, it gave me a lot of control over like where things would be laid out in memory because that particular intro had this caveat where um because of the auto start so you you'd load it from disk and then you just wanted to type run you didn't i didn't want people to type like sys whatever uh and to do that, you need it to load over basic memory, and then, but then when the intro started after decompressed, I also needed it to get decompress over basic memory again uh, in order to use basic to generate sign tables. 
so the so the way I would do that is I would relocate the data and then decompress it kind of back where it originally was and then return to basic and it would continue running from there. Um, and I'm pretty sure that kind of thing would be possible with Xmiser, but it was just easier with my own packer anyway. But anyway, I, it was mostly just that I wanted to do that is why we used a custom packer. But because I never beat Xmiser, I always wanted to do that again. And I took a long time off of that project just because, yeah, it, I was done and it took a lot out of me. Uh, fast forward to sometime this last summer, um, and I started playing around with uh, ANS, or I actually started doing it at the end of 2017, but in particular, uh, thinking about C64 packing, um, started playing with, with TANS, which is a table-based variant of this particular entropy coder. And I got that working. I didn't get it working on the C64, but I started playing with like using that as a backend for that packer. Um, and got some decent results, nothing super spectacular, but at least it was nice and simple and I could kind of figure out how it worked. Um, but then when I was developing this, this other packer for the decompressor in our 64K packer, uh, it got me thinking about that again. So I just took the little packer that I developed and I just ran it on, on the intro on, on makeshift's uncompressed data. And I actually got somewhat promising numbers. And so then I just thought like, okay, I know that this current packer that I'm playing with here has good encoding i know it has not great encoding necessarily but good encoding i know it has a good parse so let's just play with the encoding a bit and before long i actually got it to to definitely like easily beat what i had before on the c64 so i started kind of thinking about how i can how i can just modify this slightly to use almost exactly the same encoding but i can tweak it to perform a bit better on that data and in particular, I could replace the entropy coder because the entropy coder I use in the 64K decompressor decompressor uh, is a 32-bit arithmetic coder. Um, and that we're not going to do that on C64. So I started looking at ANS again because um, it would at least be a little easier. In particular, I started looking at TANS again, but that uses static probabilities and this coder uses adaptive probabilities. So... Um, what I did is first I just took my 32-bit arithmetic coder that I had there and I dropped it down to use like 8-bit probabilities and like 16 bits for the update. Like that actually didn't lose very much precision, so that was pretty promising. And the same thing with ANS is just a bit less code, I guess. So um, played with that too. Um, but I, I kind of wanted to avoid that multiply, so I tried a bunch of like ideas in my head about how to <clears throat> how to sort of move around the range like you do in ANS uh, or like jump out of your renormalization range and stuff. It's it's a bit bit confusing. Um, if you guys ever are interested in this, Charles Bloom has this awesome series called Understanding ANS. And I'm not going to get into this too deep. Um, I do want to link this, though. Uh, but anyway, uh, he has, in this 12th blog post, he has this kind of uh, he actually talks about this setup here where you don't have this symbol sort order correct. Um, it goes in kind of this RNS order. And then you, when you jump between this renormalization range and these precursor ranges, you're not proper scaling, but this does still work as an entropy coder and you lose like one or 2% ratio. So I, I thought of a really simple way to do this approximation in 6502. And then I started like playing around with, okay, how can I try to get some of this back? I played around with some, messing around with some sort order stuff and that didn't end up working. I started writing a blog post about it and then I realized he actually covers all of that here. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, fast forward to this weekend where I'm at demo bit and I'm still thinking about this stuff and writing down notes about like, how could we try to get precision into this coder where it's like, we're approximating TNS, but we want to do it without the tables because we want adaptive probabilities. Um, and I started talking to comms of TBL who was also at the party and he was, he was talking a lot about how they do fast multiplications on 68K for like Amiga. Um, and he, he showed me how to generate these kind of multiplication tables they use. Cause I guess one of the things that he used was this uh, for faster multiplication, he could do this thing where you do like A times B is the same as something like A plus B squared minus A minus B squared divided by four or something like I don't remember the identity exactly. I have it written down somewhere, but and he taught me how to like generate tables for that. I thought, okay, that's actually great because if I if I can do that, then I can just do a full eight by eight bit, eight bit multiply per bit, and then I can use RANS on the C sixty four. And on the plane ride home, I was thinking about that, and I thought, you know, I bet it's actually fast enough to do a multiply to just do straight up eight by eight bit multiply on here. 
And even if we end up with like 300 cycles per bit, which we don't, we should end up with like, I think 150 to 200 on average. I think it's actually more than that in my setup now. But even if we end up with like 300 cycles per bit, we're only going to decode 4,096 bytes worth of bits. And that should only take about 20 seconds, which is a lot of time, but it's not that much at the beginning of a 4K intro, as long as you're gaining a lot of that back. So I looked into, uh, can this be, can I basically do RANS with a really simple setup on this 8-bit computer? And it turns out I totally can. So what I'm working on now is exactly that. I've taken the coder that I have uh, in the 64K packer and stripped it down so that right now it's only coding everything as literals. Uh, and right now it's also using static probabilities. Uh, so like I've commented out the update function here in the model uh, here, which I'll get to later. Um, <clears throat> but long story short, uh, this actually totally works. And I want to show some of this code. It's not much yet. So what I did is, is I also did this other intro called Witchcraft. And this was a, a collaboration with Pegboard Nerds where we just, he did a, Alex from Pigboard Nerds did a cover of a Pendulum song called Witchcraft. Um, and I guess that's where Burn the Wits is coming from, Zakwar. Uh, actually, wait a minute. I can just do this. Just show you roughly what that is. Uh, actually, that doesn't matter. <laughs> the point is, it was another intro and I used this other packer. So I took that project and I stripped down everything so that the only thing that it actually builds um is just enough code to, to write this text uh and that's to help me see that okay yeah the decoder works if i can read this text uh and so far this actually does work <clears throat> but anyway what i'm working on now now that i've proved that this decoder works and i want to talk about, about how it works as well what i want to do is just sit here and keep fleshing out the code because i've reduced the codec to only be only doing literals but we need to do matches as well and also need to do um adaptive models and proper selection of contexts uh, for picking those models. So I know that this is kind of a lot and there may not be that much context in what I've provided uh, and what I've said already, but just bear with me here because I think I think this is pretty cool and I really want to work on it. Um, so I'm just gonna gonna continue doing that. Um, but I guess before I start, I do kind of want to talk about the code here. So this is this is the Rust version of the decoder. Um, and again, we're basically ignoring stuff right now. Uh, but a literal is encoded as just like eight consecutive bits. And right now I use just the same static probability for all those in this sort of reduced version that I'm testing with, which is, uh, so I use 8-bit probabilities. And in this case, all of them are 110 out of 128. So it's a little bit biased towards zero which is fine. Um, and so I, I use 8-bit probabilities and I use a 16-bit state. And if we, if we look at RANS, RANS is the sort of range coder variant of ANS. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Um, and I want to just kind of pull this up here. Uh, I'm just pulling up rig RANS because this is one of the easiest sort of simplest formulations of this in the wild. Uh, let's see, RANS decoder. All of this is sort of motivated by decoder simplicity. And in particular, these two functions here. Uh, the main thing is in RANS, uh, in this case, it's like, I think it uses 32 bit states. Um, is what this RNS state thing here is. I think it's just a, a U32. Yeah, the whole thing. Um, and to decode a symbol, you basically mask off the bottom bits, depending on what scale bits are. You mask off the bottom bits, and then then you can that gives you at least like a consecutive range that is split up between your symbols, and you can just pick. You can find out, or you mask it off, and then you see within which symbols range you're in, and that gives you the symbol. And then to advance it, you do this really simple formula here where you shift out some bottom bits, multiply that by the frequency, add back the lower bits from that mask, and then subtract a bias depending on the symbol, which is the start of the range for that symbol. And then while that resulting number is less than this particular renormalization number, then you pull in bytes. And if you take this and you start kind of tweaking stuff here and moving stuff around, 
Um, you can get this to do a bit at a time instead of a byte at a time. You can get this to use a 16-bit state instead of a 32-bit state, and you can get the scale bits to be 8. And then things start to actually look really good for an 8-bit CPU, except for this multiply, um, which is actually not that bad either. So you basically have the state in two bytes, a low byte and a high byte. So this becomes read in the high byte, do a multiplication by your symbol's frequency, add back the... Um, the low byte from the original state and then subtract a bias depending on the symbol and then while while the top bit of that is not set so while the sign bit of the high byte is not set you just pull in bits and all that together except again except this multiply actually ends up being not very much code and even the multiply here only ends up being like 10 instructions it just takes like 130 cycles or something on average to run but anyway just to look at the 6502 equivalent of this this is decode bit here um, cause I'm doing everything bitwise, which makes things really nice because then when you have like a range of symbols, you just have a prediction for whether or not it's going to be one, everything before that range is one, everything after is zero. So it makes that basically a comparison. So in this case, uh, the decode here is just masking off those bits, which in our case on 8-bit CPU is just taking the low byte. Um, and then we can just see if that's less than our prediction or not. And that'll give us, if it is, then we have a one, otherwise we have a zero. So here I set up this prediction, which I load from the context. Um, I compare the low byte of our state to this, and if it's greater than or equal to, we're going to have bit 0, otherwise we have bit 1. Maybe I can swap this around to make this code smaller, we'll get to that later. Right now I'm just trying to make it work. Um, I mean, it does work, but I need to add back all the features of the coder before I start really optimizing this. <clears throat> but yeah, in the case of a bit 1, uh, we're going to increment the symbol, which just makes the output symbol 1. Uh, and then to go straight to updating the state. If it's zero, we're going to swap the our prediction. So instead of predicting that first part of the range, we're going to need to predict the end. So our prediction is going to be that smaller part of the range, which is what we do here. And then our bias is going to be the prediction. So we just move around these two variables. Again, the prediction being frequency in this case and the bias being this value. Um, so that's all set up then. And then the rest is the same. So we're going to do this formula here. And again, we do an 8-bit multiply with the high byte of the state because state shift right scale bits is literally just taking the high byte if scale bits is eight. We're gonna take that and we're gonna take this this frequency or this prediction, multiply those together. And then we get the, at the end of this code, then this X high value stores the low byte of the, of the results. And then the accumulator has the high byte. So we store the high byte in product high, we load the low value, then we add back this initial state bits. So we're doing this as a 16 bit add. And then we subtract this bias value, which is here. And then that's all it is. So it's really not much code at all. And then we renormalize. And because we're using a 16 bit state, we can make our normalization range just use that top bit. Uh, so we can do the whole thing. Like we already have the high byte in our register here. And the sign flag, which is going to tell us if the top bit is set or not, which is the one we want, is already going to be set just by after we do the subtraction. So already we can just branch if that is set and already to not renormalize. Otherwise, we're going to pull in bits until it renormalizes. And so I have this decode bit that's going to input a bit, and then that will actually store it in the carry. So we can just do straight rotates into this, into this state variable and then renormalize until we're done. So this is basically the heart of that decoder and this totally works. And so then the rest of it is about like, which prediction do we actually feed into this? Um, and then the higher level stuff about like, what values do we actually pull out of this? So I'm really stoked to see that this works already. Uh, and we do get a very small amount of compression, just as is, uh, which is here it's it goes from 168 to 162 bytes it's only six bytes difference but that is this is good enough for proof of concept because it's like it just uses a slightly biased to zero prediction which means we're testing both uh if it's zero or one bits correctly and the renormalization has to happen like everything has to work for this to work as is um and then the rest is just going to be uncommenting things in the encoder on the rest side and then kind of writing that stuff in assembler at the end of all this, what I want to do is just start optimizing, but my goal for today is just to get as much of this running as possible. I think I've explained enough now. Uh, by the way, howdy guys in the chat. Zakwar, Mad Moose, Mr. Tobe, Deru2, VG Turtle, how's it going, man? Uh, Dark Second, uh, Pyro ESP, 8 Little Bits, thank you so much for the sub. I really appreciate that. Um, 
I missed some questions here. <laughs> uh, yes, I'm testing this on emulator. I'm using Vice. I don't know which version this was. Uh, about 3.1, I guess, is the version I have here. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of info, huh? <clears throat> But anyway, I just I just think it's really cool that this is so little code actually. Like the only really complicated part here is that eight bit multiply, um, which is still not much code. It's going to be slow. I expect that when we get a full intro in this, um, it's going to take like twenty seconds to to decompress here. But that'll be fine. Before I before I get too much more into this though, I want to show you guys what this looks like when we run this in this debugger. Uh, might be f too fast to really see, but I'm just gonna load this. It all happened really fast. Uh, but what happens is it gets loaded to here and then it relocates itself up to here and then it decompresses it. And then at first it sets up a bunch of um, predictions, which it doesn't actually use, only use the first one right now, but it builds the tables for them and then decompresses itself to here and then it runs there again. Uh, so if I if I run this again, we might be able to see some of this. Uh, in fact, I think I can probably... Did I miss it already? I think I did. Okay, so, so what it did here is it was loaded into memory and then it relocated itself. So it always relocates... Um, <coughs> it always relocates uh, a full, I think, 12 kilobytes from this lower region of memory into this higher region of memory. And it does that uh, in case the compressed size is, is a lot bigger than it should be. Um, I think I have that down to eight in the released intro, but anyway, so it always does that just to be conservative. And then, uh, then the first thing it does is it builds out these tables here or this table here, which again is the different predictions that's going to use for different or for the context modeling. Um, it doesn't actually use those yet. It just sets up the table. And then it's running out of here and decompressing all this data into this memory here. In fact, we could see all this blue stuff here. Here is where it's actually decoding. In fact, it might even be done just because it looks like it's running here again. Um, but once it's done decompressing, then it's going to run out of there. It's going to jump back into the decoded stuff and run that. A dark second says, can I test that a full intro? I can, I can, but it's going to be slow. Uh, so I'm just testing with this small thing first. And I'm going to keep... Um, Keep commenting in uh, encoder details until uh, until we have everything that we need, and then I'm going to test on the full intro at the very end. Anyway, yeah, so that ran that again, or it decompressed all of that, and then I guess now it's running. <laughs> <coughs> so yeah, uh, super stoked that this 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 entropy coder actually works. Um, Uh, no, VG Turtle, that is not Vice's debugger. That's uh, a tool called C64 Debugger by the Samar Productions guys, I think. It's demo scene group. Um, so that's a really good tool. It's not Vice, unfortunately, but really helpful. Uh, anyway, so what what I pointed out in the debugger, I'll just run it again so I can visually show what I'm talking about here. Uh, yeah. So I mentioned that it sets up all these contexts here, all these predictions that it doesn't use yet. The next thing I want to do is I want to actually make it use those. Um, the only thing that we should see is a bunch of these should go blue as it's decoding, as it selects different context, contexts. And that'll just get give us an idea of whether or not it's working correctly. And then I want to actually make those adaptive. Um, and the reason I'm doing this stuff step by step is because it's really finicky. Um, so just doing as, as little incremental steps or as small incremental steps as we can is really helpful when implementing this stuff in straight up assembler. I think there's a few things here that I can already like see like this. If I reverse this logic, I can probably swap these two around and I'll save like two bytes doing this and a lot of those kind of optimizations, but I'm trying to hold off on doing too much of that until I get everything in place. So, so don't yell at me if you see a lot of obvious stuff like that. Um, it's only going to distract me and that's not fun. So yeah, here we have the initial model predictions and so already the code here in on the Rust side is selecting different different contexts here, like different predictions. 
Um, so we're more or less just going to port that code. Yeah, totally, Pyro. So I mentioned that with the that squares approach, um, and that totally works. Uh, but then that doing the squares itself, you want to generate a table for that. And instead of generating the table, I'd rather just do the shortest multiply I can, even if it's not very fast. But I may look into that stuff to balance speed a bit here if this becomes a problem. But yeah, that's a that's a really good find. It's always cool to have those different mathematical forms that we can we can choose to use. <clears throat> so yeah, um, that's what we're working on next. I'm actually going to pull this code down below, I think. But yeah, we wanted to select this different context. I think what I did here in this coder, or this decoder so far, uh, so we're looking at decode read bits, which is this function. So it expects contexts, which is sort of like a base context. And then as it decodes bits, it's going to select different contexts off of that base. Um, so when we call this, for example, here we're going to decode literals. So we, we set up the the base context for literals into this, this pointer here. And then we load the number of bits we want it to read. And then we call read bits. And read bits is going to read that many bits into this 16-bit read bits low and high uh, variables here. Um, and this all works, except I think right now it just, it just pulls that first context that it uses here. And that's the part we're going to change first. So the way we need to do that is we need to, um, in fact, I think, no. Okay. So the way the Rust code does it is it sets up um, a context bits value at one. And then as it reads in bits to the value, it also reads those same bits into uh, a context variable. So it's like essentially one shift left the current bit number plus the value that's already been decoded. And that's what it uses to select the context. I don't know the best way to do that because if I just put the one bit in this variable first and then started shifting stuff in, we'd need to remove that one bit later. Uh, and I'm not sure if it's easier to do that because shifting kind of sucks on C64 or figuring out a mask, for example, or if it's actually easier to just do two of these 16 bit temp values, one of them with the one starting at one, one of them starting at zero, um, and then shifting into both of those at the same time. I think I'm going to do that approach because it's a little bit easier for me to conceptualize in my head, um, but it might be a little bit wasteful, but we'll go with that. Uh, okay. We need to const read bits um it will do context bits low and we just we're just picking some zero page variables here i just have a list of these ones that are free so we'll just start at fa or f7 here just to keep it away from some of these So then in read bits, we're also going to store y into context bits low. So the reason I'm using store y here is that I actually keep y at zero the entire decoder because you only really need simple loops for this. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Vee Turtle. I, I have not thought about that. Maybe, maybe that is something I'll think about. Hey, Michael C. Uh, we actually want one here, so I'm just going to be cheeky and do this. Whoops. I'm glad that wasn't a password or anything. <laughs> um, but yeah, this loads one into context bits, and then here we decode the bit. That actually reads the bit into the carry. So I'm actually going to push and pull the the program status words right here so that we preserve the carry. And then we can do this exact same shift into the context bits. So that should, this should do exactly the same thing. It should look, look, look the same at least. But now these will be updated. And what we want to do here is for selecting the context right now, we just take these 
decode bits context values. What we want to actually do is add back these context bits. So we can do clear carry load context bits low and then add context bits low. Store that in low and then we'll leave the carry because we're going to do 16 bit bit addition here. So we're going to add context bits high. That actually should be it in terms of context selection. That wasn't a lot of code. So the fact that that worked is actually a really good sign because that should mean that it's reading a bunch of contexts that are at least all reading the same value. So if I run it in here, what I hope to see, and we may not be able to see it, there, actually, that was really good. I did see what I was looking for. Uh, this green area here, which is the table of contexts, we should see a bunch of blue dots at the end of it, which are all the literal contexts. Uh, so if I run this again, and you watch that area, you see a bunch of blue dots at the top. So that's exactly what we should see. Um, so that's great. I don't know what is happening down here. Looks like the stack is just going nuts. And I have no idea why. <laughs> I don't think it really matters though. Um, oh, probably because it enabled interrupts. And we probably have banked. Yeah, this doesn't really matter. Um, yeah, so I think that selects context. I'm actually going to commit this really quick. That's great, Michael C. Um, was it just because you were curious about 6.02, or do you have a, a project in mind for that? Um, no, different contexts in decoder. So... That's basically it. Now I think we just want to do the model updates actually. So the model updates that I chose are really basic, but we have to be a bit careful here because they're, we're using 8-bit states, which is not a lot of precision. It's it's actually decent precision, but it's not a lot of range. Um, so typically the way that these models will work, if we ignore this bottom part here, uh, which I'll just comment out for clarity here, essentially what we do is we have, so this is going to update a particular context after we've seen the symbol. So it's either going to be one or zero. If it's one, we basically want to take where it's at and move it closer to one. And the way we're going to do that is we take basically one minus the value, shift that right by some learning rate, and then add that back to the thing. Or if it's zero, we're uh, doing the slightly simpler form going the other direction. Um, one of the nice things about the way that this happens is it doesn't like overflow or underflow. Um, actually this part we can ignore too, if we're just looking at the sort of typical algorithm for this, but because this is eight bit states, uh, shifting right by something like four, which is what the learning rate is now is quickly going to go to zero. And then what happens is that our prediction never goes as close to one or as close to zero as we would like. And we lose a lot of potential, um, compression, uh, when we don't use that effective range of our predictions. So what I've done here is if that adjustment isn't going to affect the prediction at all, I make sure that it does. Um, and the code here looks a bit redundant and a bit long, but that's because I'm kind of thinking in 6502 when I'm writing this. Um, so yeah, so it's always going to do some adjustment. And then if that overflows or underflows, then we're just going to fix that. Um, and I think that this is kind of a nice way to, to do this. Because both of these end up just being compares with zero. And I can probably do those on the same on the same or like outside of this conditional. And in fact, actually what I'm probably gonna do is um, 
bake these into the conditional in the decoder here. So the, the conditional here that decodes an actual bit, or no, it's down here. Again, this is really long because I was thinking about doing it in 6502, so I kind of massaged it until I knew it would work, and then it was trivial to port it over there. But anyway, it's these two branch arms here. So not only do they like set the prediction in the bias, I also want them to update the symbol because at that point, or update the prediction, because you already know what the prediction is going to be. So you can stuff the prediction away in a variable and then update the actual prediction of the table. So that's what I'm going to do. Uh, but it's it's this logic here that we want to follow, which is really basic. Um, I'll subtract in a shift and then maybe an adjustment for that, add it or subtract it to whatever, and then fix it if that overflows or underflows. So that's what we're doing next. So if I, if I run this now, a couple things are going to happen. First of all, it's going to recompress the data, and now it'll break. So we didn't see that message because now our encoder and our decoder don't match. And that's that's what we expected. Um, so one of the things you'll notice here is that the compression improved. Uh, we got down to, we got 28 bytes difference instead of six bytes difference. Um, and we're going to slowly inch towards the very good number, which I end up getting this down to in the end. Um, but anyway, so that changed, which is good because that means our encoder changed. The thing didn't work, which means our decoder doesn't match, which is what we expect. And then the final coder state has also changed. And right now I just hard code that into the source for the decoder, which is bad because that depends on the data. But that's where we're at for now. So E, B1. And that what that state is, that's the A and S coder state. Um, and that, because A and S codes in like a LIFO fashion, uh, we need the final coder state in order to start decoding. So that's that's why we have this. <clears throat> so EEB1 is what this was. So that should help, but of course this won't decode right still because we're using different um, contexts to, or we're actually using the same context, but we're not updating the predictions in this implementation. So, it's here, bit one and bit zero. Um, this is where I want to do these prediction updates. So I think I already have everything in the variables that I need here. So I'm actually not going to touch those. I'm just going to touch this context stuff directly. I think because that'll just be easy. This is a this is a really short encoding. This is actually two bytes to encode this. Uh, it's going to be slow to do these indirect things, but that's going to be fine. Um, anyway, the symbols one. Then the adjustment is going to be, let's just do this in the accumulator, because uh, I don't think we have anything useful in the accumulator that we rely on in the code here. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is we need to do essentially 256 minus the prediction. And the easiest way to do that is going to be um, set the carry and actually subtract from 0. Uh, so when you set the carry and put zero in, into this, this effectively treats the accumulator and the carry as one nine bit variable with the high bit set. So that's what we want. And then we're going to subtract um, the prediction itself for the context. I'm, I'm going to subtract prediction here because that's going to be a little bit faster than using this addressing mode, even though they should have the same uh, value in this case. Uh, and then we need to shift right by the learning rate, which I know is four. So I'm just going to do four right shifts here. And we know that because this is zero uh, and we know prediction actually can't be zero either. We know that the carry is always going to be clear at this point. This is always going to be in the range we want. So this should work out nicely. Um, then if this is zero, we want to increment it. So I think LSR sets the zero flag. So I'm just going to double check that. Um, LSR being logical shift right. Yes, it does set the zero flag. So uh, we can do this. If it's not zero, we're just going to go to the next. This next sort of. Uh, I don't remember what these are called. Local labels, I guess. In this case, we're going to increment the accumulator, which unfortunately there isn't really a good way to do that. Um, in six two, but we can do this. We can do add carry one. I don't like that this is a two byte way to do this. We also actually know that this is, um, 
Let's do this, actually. Just load it with one. <clears throat> anyway, this should... Yeah, so now our accumulator holds our adjustment, uh, which we know is at least one. And then we need to add that to the prediction. So we're just going to do... We know the carry's clear because there's no way that the carry survived this. And then the carry is definitely not going to survive this. And then when we loaded this, yeah, so our carry is definitely clear. So we can just do add with our context here. In fact, again, we can actually just do prediction. And then now we have the final prediction in the accumulator. And so now what we want to do is we're going to store that into the table again. But before we do that, if it's zero, after this add here. So we're just going to do the same thing again here. If it's zero, then we want to actually decrement it in this case. Because um, if it's zero, that means it actually overflowed to 256. So we actually want it to be 255 here. That all makes sense. Because the what we can have is that the prediction is going to be 255 and then the yeah prediction is going to be 255 and then the adjustment is going to end up being 0 put to 1, 255 plus 1 is 256 that's going to overflow to 0 and then if it's 0 we want it to actually be 255 so I think that's the update for the for the 1 bit case and actually we can test this piecewise we can make it not update these if it's 0 <laughs> And I would expect that this matches up. And if this does, that's actually really good because that means our context selection works and our update in the case of a one bit works. So didn't work. That sucks. Uh, so let's figure out why. First thing I'm going to look for actually is that this yeah, so this did get some expansion, and we actually expect that because with our models only updating towards one, they'll never go the other way, and that'll probably skew our predictions quite a lot. Oh, wait a minute. That totally changes the final coder state, so maybe that's relevant. I'm going to hopefully try that. I need to do the coder so that it passes this on correctly. You can see the to-do here, but for now, this is just what we're working with. Dang, I really hope that was it. <laughs> it wasn't, apparently. That's frustrating. So one thing I'm going to do here is look in the debugger just to see if anything, if it looked like anything like really ridiculous happened. I'm going to be a bit blind here, but that's fine. So I think it's around 800 here. Uh, somewhere around here is where our basic memory is. So this is where it's going to decompress into. So if we load this. Okay, so it decompressed a lot of stuff here. And what we can actually do also is sort of look at where it did that. Also, you can see it changed some of the values for our predictions. So it was definitely writing to there. So we got some kind of update. Um, and if we look at our demo.bin we can actually probably see where it started to go wrong so here is where it starts reading dc1c so already on the third byte it's wrong <laughs> yeah quite wrong and then everything just ends up tending to quite bad values I'm not entirely sure why so let's go ahead and look at the code again. So again, this is only in the case that our bit was one. I'm going to set the carry. Also, actually, I'm going to check, double check this again. Context is low, so that should be one. So 
Text bits low. Store load context low. Okay, decode bit. And we're going to push this so we preserve the carry. So we're going to rotate into Rubus low and then context bits low. This still looks okay to me. Uh, here we have, we're making the adjustment, so that's going to be 256 minus the prediction. Which you know is correct here. So that's good. We shift that right four times. That makes sense. If it's not zero, we don't need to adjust it. If it is, we're going to load it with one. We're going to add that to the prediction. And again, if that's not 256, uh, we're just going to store that. Otherwise, we need to decrement it and then store that. Now, we don't want to store into this prediction variable because we've already read the prediction and we need to adjust, update the state with that. This is just to update um, the prediction in the table. So this looks like it should be okay. And I don't know why it isn't. Um, Let's see here. I'm going to remove some of this adjustment stuff. Uh, we actually don't need to do actually this. This this might give us something useful. I need to run this through the compressor a couple times here. Uh. 8AFB. That still doesn't work. And I'm guessing what we're going to see in this other debugger. Uh, the same kind of thing that we saw before. Really? I wanted to watch it write these values. Here, everything just tends to like FFs. <clears throat> 2D1A. I think already there it's wrong. Really frustrating here because it's it's kind of hard to, yeah, it does match the sentiment. It's a bit hard to debug this. Um, so I'm just gonna read through some of these, some of these values here. We know we know that this is decodable, by the way, because um, the Rust code does run a decompression check, so we know. We know that this is a decodable bitstream, and we know that this exact code does decode it. That's awesome, Deadbringer, that you did that as well. I hope it was as fun for you to make as it was for me. <laughs> um... So yeah, just to be sure our bit length and stuff match. So we have the match length bits matches, match offset bits matches, literal bits matches. Uh, num context, num match length context works. These are the same. Actually, this should be zero because we add that to context, but that shouldn't matter because Oh, that might actually matter. No, 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 no. That I, that's actually correct. Um, because we want these to point at exactly those locations in memory. So we need context plus these ones plus the num match offs. Ooh, that's that's correct. No, because <laughs> we start with the match length contexts, which start here, and then we have the match offset contexts, which start after. Uh, the match length contexts, which is this plus this. 
and the literal ones are going to be after the offset contexts. So this should be okay. And it did look like it was reading and writing for, to and from the right uh, places in memory for that. So I think we're good there. Um, so then what's going wrong here? We do uh, set initial predictions. We load the right contexts here to decode bits context slow and high and the number of bits which is going to be eight and that totally matches what we're doing in the decoder on the rough side i'm going to do one quick one more quick sanity check here actually um just to make sure we're not clobbering any like register values or something um we need to make the state match again 85 cb This should not work, and I know why. Uh, because our adjustment shouldn't actually adjust this in this case. Like that. Okay, that works. Um, and also just adding all this stuff back should also work because it just doesn't ever store this and we shouldn't rely on the value of a in there so that's good So again, <clears throat> 256 minus the prediction. Shift that right four times, which is our learning rate. I'm just going to double check that, but it should be. Yeah, that's that's correct. And this this is going to be unsigned at this in at this point, which is what we want. Oh, wait a minute. I think I know what it is. I don't I actually think LSR does shift the bottom bit into the carry. And that's not what we want because we want we expect the carry to be clear when we do the add with carry later. Uh so LSR does shift into the carry. Okay. So then I think that's the fix. So if we just do that, I think we're going to get something that aligns again, except it won't work the first time because we need to update the the coder state. So that will not work. 8AFB was our state. I'm trying to go a little fast here. Oh, that's awesome. So this totally works with, this means the context that we use line up uh, and the first probability updates actually work. Uh, so the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to adjust that adjustment so that it tends more towards zero again. We should actually see, here we saw some expansion, like 37 bytes difference. That should actually be more extreme now because the, the predictions are going to go way more towards one. Uh, and yeah, that's what we see. So negative 75 bytes difference. So doing the same on the, first of all, I want to update the state again, 8297. Uh, and then we're going to comment back in the rest of the prediction update. This should work. Nice. All right. We're doing great. Now this, I'm going to uh, commit this really quick. No, that's the wrong one. There.
I don't have that pushed anywhere, but that's fine. So now we're going to do adjustment for when bit's zero. So I'm just going to comment out the whole thing in Rust. And I'll run this again and update the state. And then we're going to port over the, the adjustment code. Then the adjustment code in the other case, I think it's a tiny bit more complicated, but only because we need to swap around the order of, that we do um, one of these operations. So in this case, in this case, we actually start getting compression because now the Rust code is adjusting predictions in both in both um, directions. We're not going to get good compression because uh, we're not doing any like matching or anything. This is just encoding everything as literals. Um, but we'll we'll see compression nonetheless. So now EEB one is our state. Um, let's see. Yeah, this shouldn't be terribly difficult. We'll just do more or less the same thing here, except now. Oh yeah, by the way, if, when this is zero, we can do TYA there. that in that last commit uh, so the bit zero case we need to do our adjustment it's just going to be the prediction shifted right a bunch of times so we're just going to load a with prediction and actually it already is prediction because of this so we can just do lsr a few times and then same thing here If it's zero, we're going to make it one. Now, what we need to do is we actually need to, need to subtract this from the prediction. So what's the best way to do that? We're going to clobber bias, so maybe I just use that for now. <laughs> Another way we could do this is negate the value by hand, which isn't that flip all the bits, add one. So we could either store in a bias and then, sub and then set carry, subtract bias, should be five bytes. Let's just do that. Uh, and then we can load the prediction again. Thought about just using the stack there in my head, but not gonna. Could also have used X, but this is this can be fast enough. So we load the prediction, set the carry, subtract bias again, and that should be our adjusted value. But again, this can reach zero. So we're gonna do exactly the same thing we did before. Uh, or TYA in this case. No. I'm gonna load one in this case. Yeah. I think that's it. We can probably make this code shorter again, but that's not my focus right now. Yo, that worked. Oh, that's great. <laughs> this makes me really excited. Um, yeah. Okay, so now that that works, we actually wanna start like adding matches. I don't know how many of these we'll actually find in this kind of data. Uh, probably not that many. Um, 
because this particular test binary is so small. Um, so we might need to introduce some stuff that we know the compressor is gonna find matches in to test this properly, or we just start testing with a larger data set, I don't know. Um, but for the encoder, the point here is that we want to bring back our match search and everything. Uh, that This match code I don't expect to be very difficult to write, by the way. Uh, so then it'll search it, and then this will also allow it to encode this. We could probably comment out the last match offset stuff. I don't think it'll be used on this data anyway, but might as well just go for gold here. Um, and then the decoder needs, of course, to be able to decode this. But it's not terribly much code here. So let's do, whoops, I did not mean to commit that. That's annoying. Oh, well. Um, BC97. Oh, yeah, wrong code here. Just gonna have to remember that I screwed that up and then I'll have to amend that commit. Um, Okay, but yeah, so I want to see this not work first, which means that our code act or this data actually has matches in it. Yeah, so that doesn't work. 22 bytes difference. That's fine. Um. Yeah, so most of this will actually just affect this top level code here. I think right now the packet loop just assumes a literal. So we're gonna do that. So the way we do this first is we're gonna try to decode a length. So match length contexts here. And this is match length bits. So I think this is eight bits also that it uses. Uh, so after this, then the, so read bits can read up to 16 bits uh, and it stores the low bits in a zero page variable and also into the accumulator, which when it returns and then the high bits into a different zero page variable. Uh, I think because the lengths are only over eight bits, uh, we only need to look at the low one. So the literal case here is just if the length is zero, it's a literal in the particular encoding that I'm using. Uh, so what we can do is, yeah, just compare that to zero. So branch to literal, otherwise we have a match. So the length is already stored in a zero praise variable, it's what we want, and then we need to decode the offset. So we're gonna do this exact same thing. like that. Um, and then if offset zero, we're gonna need the last offset. So we're gonna need to set up a lot of zero page stuff here, but not gonna be too bad. A through E, so we got a lot here. So const. So the offset high, and then we're gonna do C in case we have repeated matches. I don't know if we'll have repeated matches in this data, probably not. I could probably print out whether or not it's using those, but it's really not that important here. Um, yeah, so now we have our offset, and then if that's I'm actually gonna do something else really quick here, uh, which is load, uh, what does this read into again? I 
One second, I'm getting a phone call I have to take.
<laughs> Sorry about the wait, guys. Uh, really important phone call I had to take. Um, which may or may not lead to some exciting news soon. All I'm going to say. Anyway, um, back to compression stuff. Um, oh, I'm not good when my head's in two places. Uh, VG, uh, was it the one about the, the bots in, in Russell Boy? Because I did at least try to take care of that. Um, I guess we'll see. Also, thanks for the bits. Really appreciate that. By the way, I'm loving the, the discussion that's going on in chat. I really want to get this done today, so that's why I'm kind of ignoring that a bit. <laughs> but I But I love it. I love that these streams are kind of a hub for that stuff. Makes me very happy. Anyway, uh, what we want to do here is we want to... I'm actually going to move the pointer here. The code will make sense after I write it. I'm just going to do this. Uh, red bits low, STA. Uh, offset low, low, red bits high, STA offset high. Yeah, so this way we're always moving the offset that we're going to use into this offset pointer here. But yeah, thanks for the heads up, uh, VG Turtle. Appreciate it. Um, so here we're going to compare. Actually, red bit slow is already an A. So we can just do a compare here. Actually, we don't even need to do a compare because we just B and E this. Uh, because I'm pretty sure it's decode read bits. Always does LDA. LDA does set the zero flag. Yes, it does. Um, so if it's not zero, we can just straight up store the offsets, or otherwise, we need to compare or load the red bits high or store there. Because here what we want to do is if, if we decode a uh, offset zero, then that actually means to use the most recent offset. So what we need to do here is load last offset low, store in red bits low, load last offset high, store in red bits high. Yeah, so this this takes care of using the last match and also storing or the last offset and storing the current offset. Um, wait a minute. I'm going to do this, actually. Now this is the logic we want. That's the logic we want. Good. Yeah, I'll probably take you up on that, VG Turtle, actually. I'm not in the Discord nearly en often enough, I think. That's just how things are for me at the moment. Uh, anyway, so this, this should set up, this loads the offset loads the offset into this offset variable. And then if it's not zero, we're also gonna load that into the last offset. Otherwise, if it is zero, then we're gonna load the last offset into offset and then also store that back into the last offset. Yeah, this logic matches uh, what I have on the rest side. Uh, so then we need to actually calculate the match position. Um, you know, we can actually just do that with this offset variable because we don't use that for anything other than this. So then for that, we're going to do uh, set the carry, because we're going to do a subtraction here. So we're going to load uh, the output position, which I think is just called output low and output high. Yep. Output low and subtract offset low. And I'm going to store that back into offset low and then with our carry 
set up correctly from this, we do the same thing. Load output high, subtract offset high, and store an offset high. So now offset points to where our match begins. And then, then we're gonna do our copy. So match copy loop. And the end of this, we're gonna decrement length. Which here, we need to do that. Store length. And branch if it's not zero to the match copy loop. So this becomes really easy. We load A with the value at offset. And I'm actually just going to call this offset. It's the way that I've done this when you refer to these as pointers. that. Uh, so we load the byte at the offset and then I think I have a function here for writing out decode write byte. So JSR decode write byte. And after that we want to increment offset. So we can do increments offset low and that does not set the carry but it stores it sets the zero flag is going to be equivalent in this case. Ink offset high, if that makes sense. And this will already increment the output pointer, which does exactly the same logic there. That should be it for the match copy. I think that's actually it for implementing this. Or not. <laughs> that's frustrating. So let's see why this didn't work. Match length context, match length bits. You could read bits. If it's zero, we're gonna do a literal, and that's it. Uh, otherwise, we're gonna store that value into length. We're going to read the offset bits. Store those in offset. And then if these are both zero, we're going to move the last offset into offset. Then we're going to move offset into last offset. Then we're going to subtract from the output pointer, we're going to subtract the offset as is. So then offset. And here we load this. We write the byte. Update our offset pointer. And then we decrement the length. Which should at least set the zero flag here. When that's zero. I really feel like this should work, yet it doesn't. So let's see, let's see if we can find anything in the debugger, at least anything super obvious. I might have to like step debug this, which I'm hoping I don't have to do. So it's writing a lot of data here, way more than it should, and it'll crash now. Why did it write so much data? Makes no sense. Just to be sure, I'm gonna check this again, that I have the right final state, BC97. Yeah, it looks right. And let's just look at the code again to make sure this matches. 
Again, we're going to read the length. In fact, one thing I could do here, I'm actually going to do a little stepwise thing here. Um, yeah, exactly, Zakware. Let's do this. I'm going to tweak the decoder here and the encoder so that the encoder doesn't do its match search which means it's only going to encode literals. And then it's still going to encode everything the same way. So it's still going to encode a length as zero and then encode literals. So this will kind of at least test that our conditional when it reads the length is correct, which it should be. Uh, so again, the final state here is ECCD. Oh. Okay, that's good that that works. So let's do this next thing here. Let's still have it do the math search. But when it encodes, let's have it not use the previous match as another baby step here. Like that. And then we'll see if that works. No, this actually didn't decode right. That sucks. But I think I know why. Offset, which should always start at one. I think it's actually because the modeling. That might work. Okay, so now decoder state still needs to match ADF0. Okay, that doesn't work. So Just remove this stuff, then this is the last match off the stuff. It's not much. Um, rebits low, rebits high, and offset high. Looking good there. I mean, it seems like this copy loop doesn't ever break. What are these ones you guys, I guess, you guys keep seeing? Are these, are these cheers? They must be. If they are, thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> but yeah, the... It should be this simple. D 
did I actually forget the end condition? I don't think so, because that's what this is. I mean, clearly this loop isn't escaping somewhere, so... I was hoping that decrement here... Yeah, should set the zero flag. Which is what this is going to check. Oh, yeah, Mad Moose. Um, let's see. So, again, with mass position is the output position minus the offset. Which is correct. So, we're going to load from offset and then write the byte. So it's the same right byte that the literal uses, so I know that's correct. We also always increment the this offset pointer here too. Load the byte, store the byte, increment offset low. If that's not zero, which means it didn't wrap around, we're gonna increment the offset high, which is what we should do. At the end of the loop, we decrement the loop, or decrement the length. And as long as that's not zero, we do match copy loop. Asm ASMR. No, no. So I didn't do something stupid like overlap some of these, did I? These should be overlapped. None of these should be. Oh, come on. Um... So we know FD is the length. Maybe I can just watch that in the debugger and see what happens here. It's clearly just keeps keeps writing. Uh, FD wasn't it? This one. This clearly goes to zero. It reads way past the input buffer, so it seems like it's it's actually decoding like a lot more data than it should. So I'm wondering actually if it's if somehow it ends up missing. Oh, I know what it is. Uh, at the end of the match, after this loop here, we decode a literal. That's not correct. We need to jump to next packet. That's probably it. Oh, that worked. Um, just to be sure, I'm going to add back in this repeated match stuff, which should be there. Again, thanks for the cheers. That is actually super motivating. Didn't expect to be affected by things like that in that way, but alas, I am. Anyway, um, I actually hope this breaks. I don't think repeated matches would have been used in a file that's this small, but 
it did break, so that's actually great. BC97, that means we get testing on this, uh, on the repeated matches, even on a file like this. Was that BC97? So I think we're on the home stretch here. BC97. Almost, and that's actually a good sign because we didn't comment this back in. Oh, yes. <laughs> that is so kick ass. Oops, I don't still don't have anything there. Uh, so the next thing I want to do is I actually want to compress a real intro with this. Now I think this intro is kind of the original intro that I had here is kind of complicated. Um, let me look at something here. Like I'm just I'm just worried it's going to be annoying to test all that again. But it might not be. Uh, I should this commit here where I was testing stuff. Yeah, I just deleted a lot of stuff. Now this is this is not the 4K. This is a different intro, and actually this is just that one source file that changed. I'm gonna do this, and that'll bring back the demo. I'm worried about testing with this because it's going to be really, really slow to decode and also to encode because the the current compressor that I have here, the match search is really poor. Um, but fuck it, I want to see this work. And I actually think it will. It's just this might take a while. Because if we look at HXD, demo.bin, basically whenever we see these big runs of zeros, my match search is going to be real fucking slow. Um, and I've actually never tested compressing a file this large with this encoder. I do expect it to terminate. I just expect it to take a while. And the decoder actually won't, isn't really affected by that because the decoder, um, the decoder is just doesn't have to do any searching, but the decoder will take a long time. Uh, how much data is this again? Actually, we'll see how much it is packed and then we can kind of estimate how long it'll take. And then I actually want to measure it as we see if it works. <laughs> this is so slow. <clears throat> so what, what you see here, it might be hard to see on the, on the stream or on the chat, but, um, oh yeah, it's hard on the stream. You see the percentage it's done through the file. You see the original file size, which is about twice as big as the actual 4k. Uh, and then you see the current estimated best output size. And this will bounce around a bit and also the compression ratio, that is. Um, so these will bounce around a bit as it goes through the data. You'll see it pick up speed uh, when it goes between these runs of zeros and then slow down again, uh, which is kind of funny. And the reason these zeros are here is just it's more convenient just to just align everything and let the compressor take care of it. And the other compressor that I had before was a bit faster, like I had optimized it for these, these use cases. And this one, I just haven't done that yet. But I see no reason why this wouldn't work now, because unless there's some weird corner case or we hit some precision bug where like the multiplier isn't right at certain values, I don't know. We'll see. One second, guys. Okay, so this is running now, but I actually want to run this in the debugger. So it did finish compressing because we also have to change the the last coder state here uh, to match anyway. So B7D1, B7D1. So now I would expect it'll work. Also, this compress size is totally like 2K smaller than it was when I actually did that. So that's pretty great.
Um, yeah, let's let's hurry this up because my my poor sick girlfriend is waiting on me to finish, so she's not alone like she's been alone all day, and I feel terrible. But I also really want to see this work. <laughs> Um, <laughs> okay, I gotta do that one more time because I really want to test this. I want to see how long this takes. I, I want to estimate like 20, 30 seconds. Ready, go. No, wait. I think if I do control L, it resets. Yeah, that's what I want. So ready, go. Go. Okay, now we wait. It totally didn't work. And I have no idea why. Because you can see at one point it just blew up. That's really frustrating. But what I'm going to do is say screw it. And I'm going to go for now. And I'll look into this later. In any case, made a lot of good progress. Just to double check, V7, D1, that was correct. So, okay. Don't know why this didn't work, but we'll look into that. Anyway, thanks guys for hanging out. I gotta go, and I'll see you next time.